so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming to my show. My name is Pete K. Malley, and welcome to my stand-up show. I hope you're all doing brilliantly well. Just a little bit of advice before I start. Don't take a day off work to film your DVD and boast about it on LinkedIn. <laughs> that the hard way. My name is Pete K. Malley. If you're watching this with company and they're asking, who's this guy? Is he famous? The answer is no. I'm not. I thought it was at one point. It was close. A couple of years ago, I got a phone call from a national newspaper saying we're doing an article on called Getting to Know You. And can we do an article? I'm like, yes. We're going to email you 60 questions and we'll print the funniest eight. I'm like, yes, this is it. I am all over this. This sounds great. Andrew Ma will be calling me up soon. I better get into my politics, that is for sure. And rightly so, they emailed me. They emailed me the 60 questions. I answered them. Question 32 was, what is your favourite food? I'm like, I quite like a kebab. I am so unfamous, the kebab got more footage in me. <laughs> I laughed. It's a strange one, it's been a strange year. Just in January, in January, I was in the tube from Wimbledon to Hammersmith and saw some adverts across, you know, from me, and I saw this one here, 23 in me. You know, 23 in me, and it says, what does your DNA say about you? And as you can see, it's a safe 20 pound Father's Day offer. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it's been such a strange, year. I've missed 2020. I missed my whole UK tour. I was gutted. I really was. And I missed so many festivals. I am the compare for Ramblin' Man called the Wild, Winter Storm of Sad Fest, of Mogstock, of Gravity, and many more. So I missed all that. You might be asking why I have a logo. Are you pretentious, Pete? You ask? Yes, I am. However, that's not the reason. The reason is because when I do the music festivals, all the bands have got logos. And I need a logo, especially the thrash metal festivals. So I can, you, can, you can read my logo. So I need these logos, but I didn't really know what logo I wanted. I had no idea about a logo or a brand. I'm not trained in this stuff. So I spoke to a logo guy. I goes, I need to have a logo. What logo what do I do? And he designed this. I hope you like it. I hope you like it. It's got my name. And he said, I've designed it so the colours represent your tattoos. I said, ah, oh, thank you, that's awesome. Many people say, I love your logo, Pete. And I say, thank you. Go, it, to me, it represents the Palestine flag. And I say, I'm glad you said that. It's very important to represent the Palestine flag. I have no idea what the Palestine flag looks like. <laughs> I mean, but I've got my logo, and I like it. But just before it, he says, I want you to have a look at some logos and tell me what you don't like or tell me what you do like. And I said, OK, that's cool, I'll do that. And I said, I don't want a logo like the Arlington Pediatrics <laughs> Centre. <laughs> and I don't think we used the logo of the man who was at the company in Poland. Cheeky. And I won't be using the logo of Planica Dental and San Marcelino. It looks a fun place to go. And I won't be going here. So I got my logo, he said, OK, I know you don't want. What do you want? And I said, I don't know, dude. And he goes, let's walk down the high street with me. Let's walk down the high street and have a look at logos and ask yourself what they asked for. And I went, I like your thinking. So he goes, look, what's that? And I said, that's McDonald's. And he goes, ask yourself what they asked for. And I said, they asked for a golden arch so you could enter a new world. He's like, dude, you've got it. What about there? And I went, like, Nike, Nike. He goes, yes, what, what do you think they asked for? And I said, well, it's a swoosh. Maybe they asked for something that represents speed or fastness. Speed is the answer. Quick, quick, quickness or something. That's like, yes. He goes, dude, you've got it. What about there? And I said, well, that's Costa Coffee. He goes, what did they ask for? And I said, with well, their name in bold letters, Costa Coffee. And he went, yes, what else? And he goes, I reckon he asked when it was established. Yes, you got it. What else did they ask for? And I said, I don't know. Three bold vaginas? <laughs> it's been a strange year, so I got my logo. And it's been a strange year particularly, because do you remember March 2020? This happened. <laughs> yes, it was Friday evening, and our leader, our Prime Minister, our light in the tunnel of darkness, spoke to us all 
on a Friday night to tell us what was coming. It was then I realised, quite simply, that our planet didn't want us anymore. <laughs> you know, it gave the dinosaurs 160 million years and then God threw a stone at them. Gave the mammals a chance, eight million years of being nearly humans, and God must be feeling like a Scottish football manager at a major tournament. <laughs> oh, I don't intend just fuck it, next. <laughs> it was strange, it was like that scene from Armageddon when Boris Johnson was doing his speech. You know the scene when the president's, you know, he's doing his talk about the brave astronauts going up there. It was like, it was like that scene in Armageddon without the slow-mo or Bruce Willis, or any sort of coolness or style whatsoever. Do you remember that scene? It was a weird one where you've got the president talking and it pans to the countries and some people are watching it all on TV. And some people, and some countries are all around the transistor radio watching it while they hear the speech. And you're asking, why the fuck are you watching a radio for? <laughs> but that's what it was like. It was a strange day. He told us, didn't he? Boris Johnson told us what was happening. Boris Johnson is like a love child of when Donald Trump fucked a pack at a monster man. <laughs> I'm not gonna slag off Donald Trump. I'm not gonna slag off Donald Trump. I actually don't mind Donald Trump. I think he's good at a lot of things. I know you're thinking, really? But I want you to think about it, Donald Trump. The only man in the whole world who could be described as baby shit orange. <laughs> and we forget with Donald Trump. He's, he's a talented man, he's gifted. Think about it. He talks so much shit, we've forgotten he looks like that. <laughs> That's a talent. Anyway, back to Boris. Boris, he was there, surrounded by his scientists, his sage scientists. Now, they had to have someone who looked like scientists, right? Because the UK population doesn't really know what a scientist looks like. The only representation we've got of scientists are the personal advert, porn, or the human centipede. <laughs> so who's there? With the scientists. Who would have thought four months later we are arguing over masks? It's Maskgate. Oh, the woman in co-op, she's not wearing a mask. He's not wearing a mask. She's not wearing a mask. I'm not wearing a mask. Because masks aren't cool. Yes, they are. Trevor, Trevor on Facebook says, I'm not wearing a mask because if you can't breathe in the oxygen, oxygen will go to my brain. Won't go to my brain. It'll give me brain damage. Trevor, the damage has been done. <laughs> friend Arlene on Facebook. I don't know if you like Facebook or not. However, she starts off with, I don't know if you know this, but my friend's a nurse. Here we go. Arlene, I don't know if you know this, but my friend's a nurse. And I don't wear a mask because carbon dioxide, I don't know if this is common knowledge and the government want you to know this, but my friend says it and she's a scientist. Carbon dioxide is poisonous. I'm really hoping Arlene hasn't found out about the current climate crisis. I'm glad Greta Thunberg didn't take three weeks off school for nothing. So we had this time, I knew Boris Johnson saying, you've got at least three weeks off. You've got three weeks off work. You'll be three weeks, not gigging. You've got three weeks at home. Like many people, I thought three weeks. What am I gonna do in three weeks? Simple. That's what I'm gonna do in three weeks. I've got three weeks to do that. And I know you are thinking, oh, come on, Pete, really? And I'm not stupid. I know I can't do it alone. I need help. And I need professional help. And I got professional help. Yes, I did. <laughs> with Joe. Oh, what's not? How easy is it going to be? I'm going to watch this. He's like, yeah, well, you know what? Mums are doing it. You know what? Grannies are doing it. OAPs are doing it. Families are doing it. That was 20 minutes a day. I don't know what a burp it is, but who couldn't do 35 seconds of exercise? Answer, me. <laughs> He's like, okay, we're gonna do like, what we're gonna do is gonna do a reverse left leg lunge, then a reverse right leg lunge, then a double squat. I'm like, whoa, dude, whoa, three instructions. I'm a man, I can barely remember the last one. <laughs> so unlike many people, in the UK and worldwide, this was me. Yes, I wore trousers with no pockets for four months. I wore the same pair of joggers every day. 
and I succumbed. I succumbed to things like Facebook. I succumbed to things like the news. The news 24 hours a day on multiple devices. I didn't control what I watched on the news. The news controlled me. And it shouldn't even be called the news. I don't know why we call it the news. It isn't new information anymore. Breaking news isn't breaking. It's not new. We shouldn't call it the news. It should be called what went fucking wrong today. <laughs> Trump. That's what you should call it. And I watched the news and got sucked into the news and I got sucked into social media. Yes, I got sucked into Facebook. Facebook used to be a great place. I used to feel like Mrs. Mango. I went into Facebook, I got a bit of gossip, I left. We all know Facebook. The point of it is you put your picture and your life story with a filter, the best bits of your life in it to make everyone else feel shit. That's the point of Facebook. It's wonderful. Already though, all of a sudden it turned into points of view. It turned nasty. The Black Lives Matter debate it turned nasty. I'll tell you what, in the UK, you take, doesn't get angry or doesn't show anger when you see images of children starving, of genocide, of burning down land, of people fleeing their country because of war. That doesn't make them angry. Remove an episode of Little Britain, holy shit. The shit hits the fan. Why are you removing it? that scene from Faulty Towers? Oh, well, you know, kids might copy it. Don't be so stupid. Kids don't copy stuff. Kids don't copy what they see. Really? Have you ever gone outside and see kids play football? Not even in the park. Not even a living in versus a living. There's about three versus two. They haven't even got football. They've got a packet of crisps. One gets tripped up, there's no referee. That doesn't stop them. <laughs> Kids do copy. Kids copy all the time. And Facebook went mad. Black Lives Matter kicked off Statue Gate, do you remember? Oh my God, I can't believe you're getting rid of these statues and pulling them down. I can't believe they're keeping up these statues. I've got a friend of mine, Jono. Jono's reasonable, but he tries to reason with Facebook like it's a real person. Puts in, let's compromise. It's Facebook. It's not going to work. I think we should compromise. I think we should keep the statues but have a plaque with more information of content about that statue. For example, I think he means Gandhi statue. You could say this guy was amazing, one of life's greatest heroes, and his anti violent stance of resistance was amazing but his ideas about women were a bit odd. Oh, Churchill, one of the greatest prime ministers and leaders ever. He got us through World War II with his courage and his resilience and his determination, but he didn't like Indians. <laughs> <laughs> That's not gonna work. I'll tell you why it's not gonna work. That's why it's not gonna work. This here is an art gallery. It could be like a museum. And what do you see? I'll tell you what you see. You see women. Women looking at the art, reading about that art, appreciating the art, judging about that art, learning about that art. You see men pretending to look. <laughs> I can go to a museum, it takes me just as quick to read the information. But oh no, no, I pretend to read it. Simply put, quite frankly, there's things in this world that I don't know, and I simply don't care about. I'll tell you what I do care about, music. I love music. I love rock music. I love blues. I love jazz. Don't really love jazz, but if you keep that bit in, that would be cool. Uh, the my woke points. I love stuff. I love the music scene. I wanted to be a guitarist when I was young. That's all I wanted to do was be a guitarist. But the thing is, though, I can't be a guitarist because I couldn't help but make the sound of a guitar. I was on stage like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Dude, having a stroke. So instead, I kind of just dressed like a, I like heavy metal rock music. That's the way I dress anyway. It's quite cool. Apart from today, we'll make an effort for you. Uh, but you know, a dress, I've got like typical rock, rock fan. I wear trainers. I've got 16 festival t-shirts. I've got 114 rock band t-shirts. And I've got one pair of jeans. <laughs> you know, I just dress the same. One thing I don't get about us rock fans is the chain. Get the chain. 
But apart from that, I'm a typical walk fan, I think. I've got the t-shirts, I've got the jeans, I've got tats. We've all got tats in the walk world. All the bands have got tattoos. We love tattoos. I've always wanted a tattoo. I love tattoos. Everyone's got tats now, though. Every single person's got tats. In fact, I now watch a TV and I think and wonder what tat they've got. I look at newsreaders. I look, wonder what tattoo they've got. Politicians, they've all got tattoos. We might not see them, but they've all got tattoos. Boris Johnston. Boris has got a tattoo. I'm sure you know. I know. I've done my research. Boris has tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Hancock. We all know Matt Hancock. I don't know if you've seen his tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just the Conservatives with tattoos. The Labour Party have got tattoos. The opposition, the old opposition. Jeremy Corbyn. I love Jeremy Corbyn's tattoo. Fuck this is the system. <laughs> And of course, the smiling assassin, Dominic Grab. We all know Dominic Grab. He's got the best of two ever. <laughs> <laughs> if you're thinking, is that Patrick Swayze, the late, great Patrick Swayze, whose head is slightly too small for his body, as a centaur in front of a sort of garish purple colour with badly drawn rainbows? Yes, it is. No one puts baby in the corner. He would fucking run in the corner if you saw that. <laughs> and if you're thinking that's the worst tattoo I've ever seen, give it 40 seconds. The worst tattoo I've ever seen, and one of them is Zach Ellis. God bless you, Zach. Zach Ellis, you may not know the name. Zach Ellis is a kid from Wolverhampton. And bad Zach, Zach was naughty. Zach went to H. Samuels went in there and stole loads of jewelry. Then he ran through the high street in Wolverhampton back to the car park, got in his car, drove home. An hour later, the police had caught him. He must have wondered how. Zach might have forgotten that car parks have got cameras. And he might have forgotten that it had his name and date of birth on his neck. <laughs> Zach, you're a stupid boy, but not maybe as stupid as Frankie Halley. Yes, Frankie Halley, possibly the greatest of two ever made. This. Here's Frankie's tat. Beautiful, isn't it? Just take a minute to admire this. It's quite something. You can see the blonde hair is the shoulders. The face is the back. Her bosoms is his buttocks. Frankie must be proud of that, and the tattooist must be utterly proud of doing such a wonderful piece of art. And Frankie must have wanted to show off that tattoo for at least nine weeks. Because after nine weeks, Frankie got sent to prison. Ooh. Yes. Frankie's asshole is wider than Prince Andrew's alibi book. <laughs> so, if you want to get a tattoo, and maybe your partner, or your parents are saying you can't get a tattoo, no, 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 no. Because when you're 70, you're going to look stupid. You're not getting a tattoo. And you really want to get a tattoo? You really want one? Remember. Never don't give up. <laughs> oh, I nearly forgot to say congratulations. Congratulations. Congratulations to you, Vladimir Putin. <laughs> wow. Wow, another 16 years in power. Been voted into 2036. That is some going. And it was a vote, and it was a landslide. Democracy in action. <laughs> you know what, that doesn't scare me too much. The pandemic doesn't scare me too much. Financial ruin doesn't scare me too much. What does scare me is the thought of Boris Johnston, yes, our Prime Minister, being in power to 2036. And you're saying, Pete, no, no, it doesn't work that way, Pete. He can't be voted in for another 16 years, but it's 2020, anything can happen. But then they think, no, he's not, they're different. Boris Johnson is different than Putin. I mean, Putin is a machine. He's a workhorse, he's a warrior, he's a fighter. Oh, shit. <laughs> Doesn't fill you with hope. Obviously, Boris idolises Putin. He idolises Trump. Why wouldn't he? If you're in power, you idolise people in power. That's just the way it is. I don't idolise people in power. I idolise these guys. <laughs> when I was a kid, I, all I wanted to be was be a rock star. All I wanted to do, I wanted to play guitar. I wanted to have people screaming my name. I wanted to have the fan blowing my hair. That's what I wanted to do. It all started when I was 13. When I was 13, 
My friend said to me, he was two years old, he said, Pete, have you ever had a thing called heavy metal? And I'm like, no. And he's like, dude, you have got to get into heavy metal. And I'm going, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean? And he goes, listen, if you get into heavy metal, he's saying, I'll tell you what was going to happen. All the parents in the neighborhood are going to... I'm gonna think you're too cool for their daughter. I'm like, yeah, cool. And he goes, I'll tell you what, all the men will want to be you. All the women will want to be with you. And I'm like, dude, bring me this heavy metal. And he's like, it's loud. Yes, it's fierce. It's tough. And I'm going, yeah, I need heavy metal. And he goes, right, tomorrow I'm gonna bring it over to your house. When your mum goes out, I'm gonna bring it over and you're gonna play some heavy metal. Open the windows loud and let's get it on. And I'm going, this sounds amazing. So the next day he comes over with his hour price back. And he brings it on. I'm like, oh, yes. He goes, I've got it here. Your mum's gone out. She's gone out. Open the windows, Pete. I'm opening the windows. Could put this on your record player and put it on loud. It's going to be tough. And it's going to be rough. And they're going to hear it from the end of the street. And they're going to think, dude, this guy is mean. This guy is tough. He is listening to heavy metal. And I'm like, yes, I love heavy metal. So I got out the album. <laughs> but I loved it. It changed my life. When I was a kid, I didn't question it. We just enjoyed it. As kids, we just didn't question it. We just enjoyed it. I, I didn't question it. I didn't question Def Leppard. Question why they couldn't spell dyslexic Leopard. Pour some sugar on me. No, don't. The bees, the bees, the wasps. I didn't question it. I didn't look a band like Kiss and realize that one of them just didn't listen. I just thought they were cool. Kiss started because Gene Simmons said, well, hold on, I'm going to do this like Ziggy Stardust thing, but make it heavy metal. And it's going to be cool. I'm going to be the fire-breathing demon. <laughs> and Pop Stanley said, well, you're going to be the fire-breathing demon. I'm going to be like the star child. But he said it in his ridiculous Pop Stanley voice. <laughs> and Ace Freely said, if you're going to be the star child, I'm going to be the spaceman. But Peter Chris wasn't listening. He went, Peter, what do you want to be? Mm -hmm. So what did you want to be? You know, I don't know. Cat? <laughs> I didn't question it when I was young. I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Things change, we change. We change, and unfortunately, life changes with us. We change. When I was a kid, I liked nothing more than going to a gig. I went to Groucho's, the second-hand record shop in Dundee, and we bought a ticket, a paper ticket. And we kept this for six months, say, put it on a notice board, clipped it in, and we were so excited. And really, things have changed a little bit. Things have changed a bit now. What happens now is I still get excited for a gig. They're my favourite band are coming to town. I can't wait. Instead, now we go on Ticketmaster. I phone up my friend and say, listen, whoever can get on Ticketmaster first gets the tickets. That's amazing. When do we go on sale? Friday morning, 9 o'clock. But actually, pre-sales on Thursday, 9 o'clock. I have no idea what the fuck that means. How can it be on sale on Friday, but actually Thursday? But we don't care, because it's rock and roll, and we are going to go. We don't mind paying £65 each booking fee, because we are going to go. And we get excited, and we get the ticket. Oh my God, we get the ticket. This is incredible. That's not changed. And for the next six months, we're like, oh my God, what are they going to do? We're going to go beforehand. What are they going to start? We ask questions. What are they going to start with? Wow, what are they going to start with? Wow, they going, to start with? going to be the new song. Who's going to be the special guest? Who's going, to be, who's going to be the support band? Oh my God, it's exciting. And that's still the same. We get to the gig. It's so exciting. We take a few selfies. We get to the gig, it's going to be great. We get to the bitch barrier right at the front. The sweat's dripping down of us. We've got our beer. We are watching the support band. They're immense. The band come on. First song, I didn't think they'll play that. That's amazing. We get excited. We're so excited. They've been excited for six months to, fit, to see that last song. Because you know what they're going to play in that last song? It's going to be the big hit. There's going to be explosions. There's going to be ticker tapes. There's going to be special guests. We can't wait. The first song comes on. We're like, yes. Halfway through the set, they're like, this is amazing. This is an amazing experience. Oh, my God, the special guests come on. We're against the barrier. We're like, this is incredible. But things change. Now, the sweat's pouring down us. We are thoroughly enjoying it. It's the penultimate song. I look at my mate, he looks at me, and we think, with the spoons? <laughs> we are happy because we've missed the crowd. We're in a pub with a pen going, oh, we, missed, we missed Jimmy Page and Dave Grohl and Jimmy Hendrix coming on from the dead. We don't care because we got in last orders. That's changed. <laughs> what else hasn't changed? Drugs. Drugs haven't changed. Me and drugs haven't changed. 
I've never really done drugs, I'm not judging. If you do drugs, fine. I don't do drugs, I've never done drugs, not judging you. However, the attitude towards me not taking drugs hasn't changed. I don't like cheese. Somebody says to me, Pete, do you want a cheese sandwich? Do you want a packet of Watsits? I say, no thanks, dude, I don't like cheese. And they go, okay. If they say, do you want some drugs? I say, no, I'm okay, thanks, I don't do drugs. And the response is this, hmm. <laughs> Oh, I bet, yeah, when you were young, you took a lot of drugs. No, I didn't really do drugs, uh huh. <laughs> Don't get that. Things have changed. We've changed. We were growing up, the thing is, so I'm, what, 47? I'm an old. And because of this, we were lucky. Things have changed. I was growing up, I was an 80s kid, and the 80s were the best decade in the world ever. I don't care what anybody says it really was. We had the best of everything. We had the best TV shows. We had the best films. The Goonies, Gremlins, Ghostbusters, Back to the Future. Weird Science. Yeah. Weird Science is the greatest film of all time ever. Have you ever seen Weird Science? It's about a pair of geeky boys who got a computer and they make the perfect women. I was a geeky boy. I had a computer and I loved women and I loved rock music. So I decided to make the perfect women. That's what <laughs> and that's what actual roles was cool. Think about it now. now, if you're thinking to me, hold on here, Pete, you being unfair. Axel Rose is still quite cool. I want you guys to honestly answer one question. Have you ever seen Axel Rose and Birds of a Feather, Linda Robson, in the same room? <laughs> no. Things have changed. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a rock star. I was thinking, I was looking at Mickey Rourke and Axel Rose. I want to be Mickey Rourke, I want to be Axel Rose. I want to be Mickey Rourke, I want to be Axel Rose. I want to be Mickey Rourke, I want to be Axel Rose. I don't want to be them. <laughs> a change. But we were lucky as kids because we had the best teachers and we had the best mentors. We had the best examples. In the 80s, we had a moral compass. We didn't question things, we just accepted it. We didn't question. There was a TV show called Finger Mouse. <laughs> we just took it on board and we had the best teachers. The best teachers. <laughs> Probably the greatest TV show ever created, ever. It was brilliant. And it, was, it taught us morals. And every single episode, what happened was, they had to go and do a job for someone, they had to fly, and BA, named after an airline, the irony, was too scared to fly. So every episode, they drugged his milk to get him into the plane. But my favorite episode of all time is he cottoned on. I ain't no fool, he cottoned on. He realized what they were doing. So they got in a, hypnoti a hypnotist, and a hypnotist hypnotized him to drink his milk to get on the plane. Genius, genius, I loved it. I loved it, it taught us morals, it taught us everything. When I was younger, I worked in a box office and I wanted to not work for a living and I wanted to be a writer. So I spent many, many months going back to my flat and writing a pilot episode of a TV show called 18 Babies, with a small a. I had B-A-B-Y, had baby face, you see what I've done there? And the pilot was, it was the 18 Babies and I had to build a contraption to get baby MacGyver out of his crash, he was getting held prisoner. And at the end, baby Hannibal got his lollipop. I mean, I love it when a pram comes together. <laughs> but then I realized that I think I needed to grow up. I did, I needed to grow up. Because I always think I need to grow up because about, I think it was maybe seven years ago, I went to a course and I was teaching, I was head of theater studies and drama. And I, was a, and, I, and I got offered a course. Now, as all teachers know, or people who don't know, teachers do this, that's every job. You get offered a course, you justify why this course is important. Really, you want a day out eating three croissants. <laughs> so I got on this course and sent it. And it was, it was a great course, I liked that thing. I got three croissants. You know the ones with posh tea bags and you're stealing them? And I went in there. And what, nobody knew each other, we were all sitting around, and there was post-it notes on the table. And the guy said, right, it's post-it notes on the table. Oh. He goes, but it's unanimous. It's unanimous. I want you to just start our activity is just write down something on the post-it notes. Okay. And he goes, I'm going to write down the answer to this question. It's personal. Oh. If you had a, super a superpower, what would it be and why? Okay. Okay. 
that was it. And the day went on, he like all coaches, it gets to about four o'clock, you to pee, you're looking out the window, you're thinking, I really want to get to that pub, but that anybody else see me go in that pub because I'm fed up with the fuckers now. And as the day goes on, the guy said, okay, we've nearly finished this course. He goes, but we've got one more activity. And he says, I'm going to bring out the post-it notes. Because the whole point of that, I didn't tell you, was just by knowing your superpower, in this short period of time, it wasn't short, in this short period of time, we now know each other so well, we know what our superpowers would be. My heart fell to my boots. And I'll never forget it. He brought out the first post-it note. And he said, <clears throat> if I had a superpower, what would it be and why? I would harness the weather so in developing countries, if there is a drought, I could bring the rain. And if there was a flood, I could stop it. <laughs> oh, Trevor, that must have been you. They give Trevor a round of applause. Oh, Trevor, Trevor. Trevor. He picked up another one. I would have x-ray vision, but not to see through flesh, but to see through pain and take it away piece by piece. Oh! That must be Libby. That must be Libby. That, Libby, that was Libby. That was Libby. Libby. Oh, Libby. Libby spelled with two eyes. <laughs> if I had a superpower, what would it be and why? I could reach through my TV screen and actually punch every single member of Loose Women in the face. <laughs> that was unrealized. I needed to grow up. I needed to change. I needed to change. I needed to be like normal adults. I looked around and thought, what do normal adults do that I don't do? What is it? They must be doing something. And I had a look and I thought, and I thought, I know what it is. They're all jumping on this bandwagon. They're all talking about it. It's a new thing. But maybe it isn't just a thing. Maybe it's actually real. Maybe I should follow a little bit of mindfulness. So practice the meditation. I really did. I thought to myself, I'm going to go Cafe Nero like an adult. <laughs> I'm going to stop rerunning Avengers in my head. I'm going to stop walking down the street and pretending I'm Bruce Dickinson from Donington. I'm 47 years old. I'm going to stop running up the stairs on my hands. But I can't do it. I can't do it. I need it somehow. So I got the audiobook. You will chant the mantra Aung San Wahi Guru with the tip of your tongue in monotone. This mantra connects you to the loving energy of the infinite source of everything and the same which is within us all. This vibration connects us to the healing energy. To end the meditation, inhale deeply and hold your breath, and then relax. This meditation was originally taught by Yogi Bhajan in 1992. I am one with the universe. It's a thread that's pulling me through. My mind is clear. I am not distracted. I have no longer got a monkey mind. It is pure thoughts on the astral plane. It's alchemy. I'm at peace. I'm quiet. My mind is silenced. Well, that's what I wanted to do. But mind was actually doing this.
wasn't working. If, uh, if the twos were my mind, mine would be Patrick Swayze's a centaur. <laughs> I tell you what doesn't calm me down, what doesn't make me relax? Teaching. Teaching doesn't, because teaching doesn't work. The reason why it doesn't work is because adults are teachers and kids are students, and the difference is too big. Kids now have got it all like that. They've got Amazon, they've got Spotify, they've got YouTube. They don't have to wait. If they want something, they get it. They never had to wait patiently with a tape recorder, with their fingers poised over play and record, praying that their mum wouldn't shout them for tea just when their favourite song was coming on. It's too different, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You say to the kids these days, listen, we can't get everything like that. We need to work for we need to wait. I want to give you an example at school. At school, our history lessons, we got a video. Woohoo! A video! Yes, not a two second snazzy video. We got a video. We were so excited about having a video. We had a video, my God, we've got a lesson in this video. They timed it. We went down, we went down to the mezzanine where the caretaker obviously swiftly hid his year seven boy in his porn collection. <laughs> Got the trolley with the TV and the huge video recorder, unnecessary big. And we were excited because we had the video. It was exciting. We sat down to watch the video. This is what we had to do. It was a different life, and kids these days don't know that. Because they've got social media, they're obsessed. They're obsessed by conspiracy theories. Obsessed. The Illuminati conspiracy theories. Once we took a bunch of kids on a trip, on a coach, we stopped. The kids left, I apologised to the driver. And the kids went, see, look, sir, look. The Illuminati. I said, what? The Illuminati. I said, what are you talking about? Look, sir, the Illuminati. I said, what are you talking about? Look. I said, it's a map. Yeah, look what it says. It's got a circle on it. Yeah, look what it says. It says, you are here. Yeah, how do they know? <laughs> They're obsessed, and it's not their fault, because they've been exposed to shit. Shit that nobody should be exposed to. They've been exposed annually to World Book Day. World fucking Book Day. A day you dress up as your favorite film characters. I'm not a big advocate of World Book Day. I love books. I love books. I read them every hour, every day. Not every hour, every day. One hour every day. I love books. I think books are one of the most important things in the world. But I don't like World Book Day. However, they could change it. Let's make an appreciation of books and reading. So instead of bringing up your son or daughter to go dress school as a muggle, ha <laughs> ha, why don't we dress them up as authors? Maybe Stephen King or David Williams. <laughs> Or Jeffrey Archer. <laughs> that would be idea. The only good thing about World Book Day is this mum here. This mum deserves an MBE. Thank you, mum, for bringing your kid into school. <laughs> Jeez. Teaching's not all bad. Teaching's not all bad, I suppose. We get presents. And at Christmas, you get little gifts. At Christmas, you got gifts. I got this gift from a year seven. World's greatest teacher. And it reads out. You're ace at doing teaching. 
you're really flipping top. When it comes to being brilliant, you don't know when to stop. If there was a teacher test, no one else would stand a chance. There's no one else as good as you. All the others are just pants. Teacher of the world's greatest teacher. <laughs> I got this from uh, year 10. Cunt. Things and roundabouts. It's not their fault, really. Maybe it's the parents. Maybe it's the parents' fault. I've uh, been teaching for a while, and not all parents are wise. Not all parents are wise. In fact, I'm going to demonstrate this letter here. I got from a parent 20 years ago. Let me read it to you. I wish I wrote this. That would be funny if I did. 8th of August 1999, dear Mr. Marley, that's me, I was head of year nine. Let me read this letter out to you. Aaron will be off school this Friday as we will be travelling down to Cornwall to witness the solar eclipse first-hand genuine letter. <laughs> as you are aware, we are a deeply religious family and we have no doubt this eclipse signals the end of the world. <laughs> As you can understand, we as a family want to witness Armageddon, the end of days, together as a family. He will be back as usual on Monday. Kind regards, Mrs. <laughs> We're doing it. We're doing it. You know what? I really did want to be the greatest teacher on the planet. I wanted to change lives, change minds, deliver dreams. But now, I just want 13 weeks holiday and get home for tipping point. And I try to go to work like everyone else and have a great day and change the world. And I have the best intentions. But like every other job in the world, like getting a microphone out of stand, <laughs> it's difficult. It's difficult because we have got to deal with the same problems. I get to school now and eventually get there and I find a crossword. I want to find a word search. I find it. That'll do. That'll do. I'll photocopy it 30, you know, 210 times. Yes, that means I have to go near the photocopier. And like every place of work, the photocopier is evil. <laughs> you get there. Finally, I find the photocopier. I put the thing in. I press 210. But of course I forgot my lanyard, so I need to put my passcode in six times. The same passcode, six times. Anyway, I've now got two minutes. The kids are at the door. I've got two minutes. I press go 210 times. It's going to come out. And it comes out. It comes out. In landscape, not portrait. What's the difference? I don't know. But right now, it's flying out. And I'm pressing cancel, 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 cancel. And it's flying out. And actually, the cancel button, no matter how good the photocopier is, has got a larger delay than PPE from Turkey. Cancel, cancel, cancel. It's flying out. I'm getting stressed. Can it be? Can it cancel it? I stop it. I put my passcode in four times. Portrait, 210. One minute to go. Cam, press, it flies out, but in A3, well, nobody uses A3, why is it coming out in A3, it's flying out, I'm trying to cancel it, and gather all this wasted paper, and look out, because I've got one minute left, and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, cancel, 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 the A3 paper's coming out, I'm putting it in the bin, it's getting there, I've got 45 seconds left, oh come on, so I put my passcode in again, five times, finally, I'm calm, come on, A4 paper, poetry, you can do this, paper jam, what is a paper jam, it's it's flashing green. It looks like a schematic from the International Space Station. But you know, I've opened it and I've got it. I've got it. It's a corner. And gently, I pick up this paper and I get out. And I've got 20 seconds left. But I remove the paper. And then it says paper tree empty. I've run out of paper. And I frantically look for paper and I find it. I find the paper. 
But is it a box? Is it a box that's held together by the strongest material in the world? It's like alimantium. I'm getting my key. I'm trying to saw this paper out. The kids are going to come in in 10 seconds. My fingers are in the box. There's blood everywhere. The skin's fleshing around. The paper's gone. Everyone about goes. The kids comes in and it's too late. I want to see an episode of 24 with Jack Bauer successfully uses a photocopier. <laughs> and it's too stressful. I've tried, I have tried to have my life less stressful. I really have. I thought maybe a job in the theatre would do it. Because I love the theatre. I love the theatre. When I was younger at school, when the teacher said, you should join the school play, you'll love it, you'll show off, you'll love it. And I said, that sounds good. What was the play? And he said, Grease. And I said, I've never heard of it. What's it about? And he goes, you'll love it. It's about a girl who goes to a new school, she's unpopular. So she smokes fags and turns into a slag. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> so it's I, I went for a job as a youth filmed, a youth theatre director. Youth, uh, youth theatre director. I went for it, it was great. But in the interview they said, what would you do in the interview? And I said, well, what do you mean? Because how could you adapt the place to youth theatre? And I said, well, I would, I've got an idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to have Fiddler on the Roof. We're going to make it a teenage version. I'm going to call it Kitty Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get a jump. It's a hard life. It is, it is exceptionally tough. I get annoyed. I get jealous sometimes. I remember my mate last year and I was watching TV and the Jacksons were on. I'm like, I'm really jealous. And he was like, dude, you can't be jealous of the Jacksons. And I said, no, I'm not jealous of the Jacksons. I'm kind of jealous of the dad, Joe Jackson. I'm like, what? And he goes, look, look at the family, look how talented they are. Look how talented they are. They're one family. He made them with his dick. <laughs> I can't even piss straight on mine. <laughs> so I think we're just going to have to sleep with a compare and a presenter and the compare. Because compare is not as easy as sometimes it looks. I want to finish off with the story. One time I was comparing, and I said to this guy, right, I want to compare, because I, like I said to all the acts, do you want me just to say your name, introduce you, and he went, no, actually, no, I don't. He said, uh, do me a favour. It's Jay. And he goes, don't introduce me as me. Just say to the audience, what time is it? And he said to me, they'll say, it's Chico time. And then he said to me, you say again, I didn't hear you, what time is it? And they'll say, it's Chico time. And you said to the audience, what time is it? And they go, it's Chico time. No, come on. And I said, that sounds amazing. So I stood on the wings, getting excited. I thought, I went through it in my head. So I'm going to go on stage. Going to go, what time is it? And they're going to go, it's Chico time. And I'm going to go, ah, oh, nah, 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 nah. What time is it? And they're going to go, it's Chico time. And I'm going to go, I can't hear you. What time is it? And they're going to go, it's Chico time. I walked on stage. I went, ladies and gentlemen, it's Chico. Oh, shit. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's me, Pete Kamali. Thank you so much. Stay safe with each other. Thank you. Good night.